When children are placed in foster care or adoption situations where biological parents' circumstances can no longer cater for that child, it is the hope that the child involved is sent to live with good people, people who love them and care for them wholeheartedly and unconditionally. But unfortunately, in some instances, this is not the case and children can potentially become vulnerable to violence. On the 8th of June 1987, Irvin Sylvester Groninger III was born, the fourth of ten siblings. When he was approximately two years of age, Irvin was taken from his biological parents and put up for adoption, where he was then taken in by the Herman family. Father Douglas Raymond Doug Herman and his wife Valerie Janelle Herman. They already had two children who became Irvin's adoptive siblings. After fostering and then adopting Groninger, Doug and Valerie decided to change Irvin's name to Adam Joseph Herman. Adam was a typical young boy who was lively yet timid and loved the outdoors, especially camping trips. He was an average student at school, but when he turned 11 years old, the Hermans removed him from his elementary school and decided to homeschool him, something which was rather odd, considering their other children remained at school. The Herman family lived in Pine Ridge Mobile Home Park in Towanda, Kansas, where Adam spent the spring and summer months of 1999. At some point during this time, Adam mysteriously disappeared, though the exact date and the circumstances surrounding his vanishing are shrouded in mystery, as he was not reported as a missing person for almost a decade. His adoptive sister, Crystal Espinosa, contacted the local authorities in 2008 to ask about the whereabouts of her brother, who by this time she had not seen in nine years. She was doing this whilst trying to organise a family reunion and, upon her realisation that nobody had seen Adam in recent years, decided to find where he was. Adam's biological sister had also not heard from her brother since around 1994 and was eventually told by Doug and Valerie during a phone call to ask how her brother was doing to quote, stop calling. During these phone calls to check in with her brother, which were made between 1994 and 1999, Adam himself never physically answered the phone. Only the Hermans did, and they claimed that Adam was doing just fine. Crystal was concerned for Adam's welfare, and quite rightly so, as when she contacted the SRS, the Kansas Department of Social and Rehabilitation Services, she was informed that Adam had allegedly been in the Herman's care until he turned 18 years old, but Crystal knew that this was not the case. She immediately called the Missing Children hotline in Washita and reported her brother as a missing person. When Adam's adoptive parents were questioned, they claimed that the 11-year-old had a habit of running away from home, and on this particular occasion in the first week of May of 1999, following a spanking, he never returned. It's alleged that the Hermans did report Adam missing on at least two prior occasions, once after he was grounded and another after not returning home on the school bus. However, he returned on both occasions within just an hour or two, hardly what many would classify as running away. According to various sources, Valerie admitted to have spanked Adam with a belt buckle prior to his disappearance, with this not being the first time that abuse was reported from within the Herman household. Three years prior, in 1996, Adam had been temporarily placed in a children's home after a similar incident ended up with him having bruises all over his body. 
With Valerie having seemingly repeated these actions, the couple claimed that they didn't want to report their son as missing because they were afraid of the repercussions after what happened in 1996, which was investigated by the SRS. They claimed to be afraid that their two other children would be forcefully removed from them, therefore did not report Adam's disappearance to the appropriate authorities, which just to note here is actually illegal in the state of Kansas. Family members, however, did not believe the Herman's story and were certain that both Doug and Valerie had something to do with Adam's disappearance. It should be noted that in 1998, a second suspected abuse call was made to the SRS by Adam's school after multiple bruising was found. Classmates noticed occasions where Adam's glasses were broken or taped together and witnessed scratches under his chin, a black and bruised nose and scrapes on his neck. The subsequent investigation concluded, however, that these injuries were sustained whilst playing sports with his siblings. Adam claiming that this was indeed the case and that the injuries occurred whilst he was playing football. According to Adam's adoptive siblings, he was mistreated by the Hermans on a regular basis, though primarily by his adoptive mother. He was often locked in the bathroom, where he was made to sleep in the bathtub, without pillows or a blanket, and he was denied food. However, his siblings did sneak in some food for him on numerous occasions. In one instance where Adam was locked in the bathroom, Valerie's ex-sister-in-law asked her why the boy was in there, and Valerie claimed that he was being punished for wetting the bed. On another occasion, she claimed he was locked in the bathroom because he was, quote, mentally disturbed. Crystal, Adam's adoptive sister, saw Valerie step on Adam, kick him and hit him on several occasions, and an aunt saw Adam chained to the faucet of the bath just prior to his disappearance. Others who knew the Hermans saw Valerie favour her biological children, and she even once allegedly told a friend that Adam, who was only 11 years old at the time, quote, gave her the creeps. Valerie shockingly told investigators that she was recommended by a psychiatrist to lock her son in the bathroom at night due to an attachment disorder such as bipolar or schizophrenia as Adam allegedly had a knife under his bed and Valerie was frightened that he was going to kill her and her husband. The story became even more bizarre, with the Hermans telling family members that Adam was now a ward of the state, after they could, quote, no longer handle him, and that he'd actually been sent to a psychiatric facility. Whether there is any actual proof that Adam was sent to such a facility remains unknown. The Hermans told investigators that they thought Adam had left of his own free will and was either homeless or living with his biological parents, but despite this, Doug and Valerie continued to cash in Adam's adoption subsidy payments, which was approximately $700 per month, until he turned 18 years old in 2005. They also claimed Adam as a dependent on their taxes when they filed for bankruptcy in 2002, racking up a total of $52,800. The Hermans were subsequently charged with felony theft in July of 2010, however reached a plea deal a year after, after admitting to wrongfully accepting $15,488 in subsidies for Adam between 2003 and 2005. Both received prison sentences for welfare fraud and for failing to report a minor as missing. Doug got nine months behind bars and Valerie got seven months. The couple were also ordered to pay restitution and a $2,500 fine each and would be subject to probation following their releases from jail. 
Justin Herman, one of Doug and Valerie's biological children who saw his mother abuse Adam when he was around four or five years old, told ABC News that, quote, she, Valerie, would punch him, Adam, pull his hair, use wooden spoons to spank him, push him. He wasn't allowed to play. She locked him up in the bathroom, made him do housework all day long. Justin continued, when she's not acting crazy, my mother is actually a good person, but when she's in a bad mood, she's a monster. Justin claimed that he never saw Doug harm Adam and that he witnessed his father trying to stop his wife from attacking Adam on a number of occasions. On one other occasion, Justin saw Valerie throw Adam against a wall where she pulled out some of his hair, following which Justin called the police. However, by the time that authorities had arrived at the residence, his mother had convinced him to tell them that he had made the whole thing up. Rather interestingly, phone records didn't show a call to the police from the Herman household as claimed. However, other family members corroborated Justin's claims of abuse. Due to the vast amount of allegations made against the Hermans by family, friends, school teachers and counsellors, a report was filed to Child Protective Services and the only undertaking they did was send the Hermans for counselling. However, they did not remove Adam from the home. Ultimately, Child Protective Services failed to protect 11-year-old Adam Herman. Police searched the Herman residence and their mobile home where they resided in 1999. However, whether any clues or pieces of evidence were found in regards to Adam's disappearance is unknown. They did confirm that no human remains were uncovered. However, quote, one of their questions had been answered. When prompted as to what this meant by journalists, authorities did not elaborate any further. It does appear, however, that police believe that Adam is no longer alive, as there's no evidence to suggest that he is. Unfortunately, after 24 years, we still don't know the fate of Adam Herman. Suspicions surrounding his adoptive parents have never ceased, and given the evidence against them, this is hardly surprising. Whether Doug or his wife Valerie harmed Adam on the day he vanished remains unknown. They denied any wrongdoing, and Doug died in 2016, taking what he knew to the grave. Police named the Hermans as official suspects in this case and claim that murder charges could still be brought against Valerie, even if Adam's remains are never found. They also claimed that abuse charges could be filed for the period prior to Adam's disappearance, as well as the fact that his adoptive parents failed to report a minor as missing. The latest developments in the case came in 2019, when a Washita man claimed on social media that he believed that he was Adam Herman. However, this turned out to be a cruel hoax. As of 2023, the disappearance of Adam Herman remains unsolved, and what fate ultimately befell him remains a mystery. An anonymous donor posted a $50,000 reward for any information leading to the whereabouts of Adam Herman. His biological family and his remaining adoptive family are still searching for the truth, and all they want is to bring him home. At the time of his disappearance, Adam Herman, whose birth name was Irvin Sylvester Groninger III, was 11 years old. He is described as being Caucasian, approximately 4 feet 4 inches tall and weighing 67 pounds. He had dirty blonde to brown hair and blue eyes, and at the time he vanished wore gold wireframe glasses. It's unknown what Adam was last seen wearing. 
In regards to distinguishing marks and features, Adam had a birthmark on his back at the waistline, which is about one quarter inch by one half inch in size, a number of scars on his abdomen, a three quarter inch scar on the inside of his left thigh is also noted. Various age progression images of Adam have been created by the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children in case, by some miracle, he is still alive today. Due to the nature of this case, foul play is strongly suspected. If alive in 2023, Adam Herman or Irvin Sylvester Groninger III would be 36 years old.